We had our first men's group for the year Friday night. There was nine of us met. And um, I have to say that's one of the, what is the best night of the week really. Like I never know who's coming. I redid a group text message and found 47 of you blokes. And it took me ages to get them on there and then I lost them all and had to start again. And I don't know, you probably use a computer to do it or something. But I thought that was encouraging. I hope you don't all come at once. Imagine that. But we don't have any agenda, but I can tell, or sometimes it's the guys who come taking time out on a Friday night, like that's your night, isn't it? And to come and spend time with other men in a place like this to just sit, read some scripture, pray and share life, those guys are like the core of of who we are and they're pressing in and wanting to know more and hear from God and it's you know, kind of like the ones who do that need at least sort of thing, but they're, they're pressing in. And I just want to challenge you, if you've never been to one of our men's nights, it's a special time. We just sat here in the circle of these pews and basically they wrote the notes for my sermon. So it works out really good. Um, come along to that. This, this morning we're going to do kind of like I guess it's a Bible study, probably most of my sermons are, but does anyone turn, remind me where Romans is again? Romans 11. I didn't actually decide which bit we're going to do as the reading. and I asked Donna to chuck the whole chapter in there and we're just going to pluck through it. So... Let me read through just the first, say, seven verses straight through. Let me do it. I asked then, did God reject his people? By no means. I'm an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. For God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets and torn down your altars. And I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I've reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened. Let's leave it at that for a second. Lord, this morning we've chosen a chapter that we've probably read or or glanced over and thought, yeah, that's what does that actually have to do with us? And I pray that your spirit will apply this personally to us, give us a bigger picture of your plan for the world and people in it, and that you'll speak to us by your spirit, that we'll we'll come out of here moved to be used by you with a deeper understanding of your love for us and a gratefulness that, as we mentioned last week, you chose us. So we look forward to just you sharing with us this morning as we go verse by verse through an amazing book written to an amazing people in an amazing time, so different to ours, but your word is alive and we invite it to do its work this morning. Amen. What I'm actually going to start with, if we can skip forward to, I'll get um, Donna working today. I think it's verse 25. Just this one, I thought, this is a great place to start, even though it's halfway through the chapter. He says, I, this, this is Paul talking to, it's called the book of Romans, so it's easy to remember. These are Christians uh, living in Rome under that Roman kind of rule. He's There's obviously something going on because every time Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this, 
it meant they were ignorant of that. He talks about that only a few times, and as I look at it, each time he mentioned, it's like, you know what, we're ignorant about this too. This is why he had to say that. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. The thing about being ignorant is you don't know you are. Is that right? And if you are, if you're arrogant in a certain area, or this word that he's using is conceited, means you're just that little bit better than everybody else, right? Do you know people like that? Uh, if we could have just point them out, we just want to deal with this now. Um, while you're looking at me, hang on a second. This isn't good. It's challenging when, when you get the hint that people think. In fact, I remember in primary school, and it was a girl. And I thought I was, you know, God's gift to the grade six girls at the time. And one of these girls said, look how he walks. He just thinks he's so good. And I just went, oh, man, there's nothing more humiliating. And I realized I was like, with my spurs on, you know, like Kananga Creek. I became school captain out of 27 kids. Like, I was up there, you know. But so it doesn't hurt to be brought down a peg. Paul's saying, I don't want you to be ignorant of this because this is one of the things we have to know as children of God, as Jesus' followers. And if we are ignorant of this, it's probably going to lead to big problems. So what's the whole issue here in fact i'll read the next bit sorry don if we can go that it's still the same verse in 25 i don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery so you may not be conceited israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the gentiles has come in that's the issue he's talking about. We're going to go back to the beginning of the chapter. It's like, well, what's Israel got to do with us in the Mary Valley? At the time, the church in Rome, if they looked around the gathering, they were all gen mostly Gentile people living in Rome. And they began to feel like, you know what? Everything we're learning, the Jews were supposed to know. And in fact, it's their book we have. And they missed the point. Not only missed the point, they killed the one they were waiting for. And we, who were nobody and knew none of this, can now see it. What's their problem? And that sentiment, they call it anti-Semitism, comes out of that. Where people have this disdain. They really hate the Jewish people. And it's in the church and people will say, well, they're the ones that killed the Lord. The Jews are no good. And we know better than that because Jesus was a Jew. So you can't say none of the Jews are any good. But they have had a tough history in part because of what we're looking at today. And it's actually quite interesting. But not only their relationship with God, the promise way back in the beginning and with Abraham, what they were supposed to do with what they knew, Blessed to be a blessing was the Abrahamic covenant. You're supposed to tell everyone about God because I'm going to sit with you. I'm going to live with you. You're going to see me face to face. And through you, Abraham and your family, the whole world's going to know me. That's the plan. Since then and since the time of this book being written when Jesus came, a shift took place. And the focus came off Israel because they failed in that mission miserably. And the focus came on who we now know as the church, who is us. The same mission. The whole world will know me, God says, through you, my chosen people. So how did we get to be the chosen people? That's what we're going to look at this morning. And as I prayed this before and, and in the room before I really hope this isn't just like a history lesson or a, a broad church kind of lecture because I didn't do that well at that at, at college but there'll be things within this that will hopefully cut you to the heart 
Remember last week we talked about some five doctrines. There's probably a couple we should have added in. I looked at that video and it's not that clear on the whiteboard. I don't know if I'll use the whiteboard that much. Maybe we need a smart board or something LED or whatever. But the point was there are easy ways to understand the massive things of the Bible when we look at one word and do a word search. And the first one we did was elect or election. The fact that God chose you. And if you're honest, when you say, why did God chose me? If you ask yourself that question, if you come up with a heap of answers, you might actually be conceited. Why'd God choose me? Why wouldn't he? The eldest of four sons. Uh, and Edwards, there's a legacy. We have a road named after us. It's not bitumen, but it will be one day. Uh, I have skills and abilities. And so hang on a second, where did any of that come from? Why did he choose you? I don't know. But after today and after reading this, I hope we can all say I am thankful because I didn't deserve it. So this, this kind of this topic of being chosen, the elect, is why I ended up at Romans 11, because the word's in there just a couple of times. But it's a different point of view, because us in the West, we're like, this is about me and God. And I even said this last night at a barbecue. Um, the fella said, that church up the road there, are they part of your mob? And it was a Catholic church. There's not many go there. And what's the difference? And I, I kind of said, well, hopefully they believe the same thing, but they do things a little bit differently. And the further you go into the Orthodox Roman Catholic kind of thing, which is actually similar to the mob we're talking about here, where it came from, the rules and the sacred things that they do, they get a little bit caught up with them, I think, at times, rather than the me and Jesus thing. And he's like, oh, yeah, interesting. Basically, these are all weird is what he meant between the lines. But we'll, we'll get there. We think in the West, in Australia, in America, in the UK and all that, this is about our life revolves around us. When we look at the scriptures, there's a bigger picture going on. And we're lucky to be included in it at all. So when we look at the elect here, there's a big picture and and. Paul's highly aware of the fact that God chose Israel first before the people he wrote this book to. I ask then from verse 1, did God reject his people? So if you read through probably the second half of 9 and then into 10, it's pointing out that Israel was disobedient and failed in the mission, right? And the, and the Romans are going, yeah, the, the Christians in Rome are going, yeah, that's right. It's, it's about us now, okay? So he's saying, hang on a second, did God reject his people? Because God actually cannot fail to keep a promise. So when he said what he said to Abraham, that's written in, what, stone, the universe. When God says it, it, it cannot fail to happen. I'm going to make you a great nation and all those things he said. So did God change his mind and just back off altogether? Complete rejection is that what he's by no means. And then he points out, look at me. Paul is a Jew. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee, highly trained in this stuff, which gave him the knowledge to help share what they needed to know. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Now, if you study the, the idea of election, this is where it messes with our heads because the Calvin and Calvinistic and the Armenian point of view, I don't know if I mentioned that last week, is like two can be complete opposites, but the scripture describes both of them. The fact that God decides from the very beginning who's in and who's out, who's saved and who's not, who's in heaven, who's in hell. You think, well, hang on a second, that's not real fair because what if he doesn't choose me? But then there's a lot of scriptures that say, choose life, choose Jesus. You need to be obedient so you're saved. So it's like God knows what happens in the end, like this, this part. 
that word there. He foreknew. He knows who's in and who's out right at the end of time. It may not be that far ahead, certainly closer than it was for these guys. But he also says, you have a part in this. They're kind of like two things that's a paradox. It's like you can't have them both, but it's something we by faith have I've come to just just be okay with. It's like eternity and trinity and things I don't really get my head around. But he decides, but I get to decide for me too, sort of thing. There's a lot more we could say about that and it only gets more confusing. But anyway, don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, Elijah, how he appealed to God? Now, if you remember, this is, um, I think it's 1 Kings around about, 18 chapter 18 I think it is this most awesome story with Elijah he has this competition with the prophets of Baal remember and how about you call your God to burn up this thing and I'll call on mine and nothing happens and they're dancing around and they're cutting themselves and I would love to have been there on his team because the other team lost big time right and he killed how many well it's like 700 of them or something like that heaps of them he just had them all killed God's fire came from heaven, licked up all their everything, and it was just a real victory. Within a breath of that moment, Elijah completely loses all hope and faith just because of a woman. Well, that, that happens. <laughs> <coughs> Can't be totally uh, down on him, but this was a pretty powerful woman, and she said, I'm going to kill you like you killed my boys. I'm coming after you. And he ran. He hightailed it. He ran like a marathon in a skirt and whatever. And um, read it anyway. But the point why Paul brings this up, he said, Lord, they've killed your prophets, thinking about everybody else, torn down your altars, and I'm the only one left, and now they're coming after me. Do you have those moments where you just feel like, I don't know if I can keep going? I'm in a class at uni that I'm it as far as breathing, believing in God. My workplace is just rough as anything. I don't know if I should be here. I don't know if I can stick my head up again. It's just too humiliating. What was God's answer to him? Yeah, mate, it's just you. Sorry. Hang in there. No. No. He didn't see the big picture. God knew a bigger picture. He said, hang on a second. You're by yourself. No, you're not. I have reserved for myself. So even here we get this hint of God doing his work for his purpose with his people and he's choosing. I've reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So if you're one of 7,000, you're not that big a deal anymore. But he was on his own at the time. So God had to point out. So too, at this present time, there is a remnant. And I've underlined that word. In the hardest times that you will go through or Christianity as a history has gone through, there's always been a remnant. There's been times in history where every Bible or scripture or scroll or piece of paper that had anything of the New or Old Testament on it was collected thoroughly and burned in a bonfire in the streets. This is the end of Christianity, they would have thought. How are we ever going to recover from this? But whose church is is building? Is it building? Is he building? It cannot fail. I will build my church. The gates of hell, which it looked like in that fire, burning such precious documents that had the hope of life. Jesus, the Lord, God in his, his bigger plan went, don't worry about this. This is barely a glitch in my plan. But it's going to make you appreciate the word, isn't it? You're going to look after it. You're not going to leave it dusty under your bed anymore there's always a remnant that will always carry through because his way will never fail and if by grace so he's talking about there's people selected 
by my grace, chosen by grace, which means they don't deserve it, but I've picked them. They don't know why they're picked, the same as you don't know why you're picked. If by grace, it's no longer by works, because if it was grace, if grace would no longer be grace. So it's pretty much saying, there's nothing to do with you. God chose to save you. So there's a people, you're not alone. And one day, as this alludes to in coming in the chapter, we're all going to be united with everyone who ever believed, including Israel, who were the first plan, or those who were the elect out of that we're going to look at. It's not, it's not every person just because they're a Jew. But he has not forgotten the nation. Let's look at what then, verse 7. What Israel sought so earnestly, it did not attain. So you notice the wording there. In all the history of the Israelites and all their um, traveling with Abraham and then trying to find the new place and then not getting there and then being in with Egypt and then the Moses story, wandering around in the middle of nowhere for 40 years, all this stuff. They were earnestly seeking the kingdom of God and whatever they thought that was. But it says what the people of Israel sought. That one says they did not obtain. My version says what Israel sought so earnestly, it did not obtain. That's interesting, isn't it, that there'd be two different ways of writing it. Because Israel as a nation certainly did not obtain what they were looking for for very long. In fact, they're the only country on earth to not have a country until 1948 last year. Last year. 1948 last century, I mean. Year, century, you know what I'm talking about. Not good with numbers. But they were a people without a place for nearly their whole existence. It's just bizarre. Like, no, There's no other story like it. What they were looking for, they didn't get. So God's used them as an example of they had everything handed to them on a platter, yet they missed it. And in fact, not only missed it, it became the very stumbling block that messed them up. Now that is actually your situation too. You have everything handed to you in a platter, especially if you're part of a church to understand the grace of God and understand the deeper truths of salvation. And if you're not wanting to press in and discover more of that, then you don't get it and you may actually be in danger of missing the point altogether. What they sought so earnestly, they did not obtain, but, here's that word again, if we can have that up, who did? The elect among them did. So out of all those people in Israel, a chunk of them just completely missed the boat and whatever. But there was a remnant in there that God had handpicked. God chose these individuals and he has not forgotten the nation because of of them as well. The others were hardened as it was written. And then it goes into um, some of the quotes from where's that one from eight Isaiah I think it is Deuteronomy there's a couple there Psalm 69 let's read them God gave them a spirit of stupor eyes so they could not see ears so they couldn't hear to this very day which seems a little bit harsh why would he do that But it starts with them being disobedient, them not wanting to know. And God, he's done this several times. He did it with Pharaoh. If you really don't want to know, and I've given you a heap of opportunities to know me, I'm going to go, righto. I'm not only going to let you not know, I'm going to encourage you to not know and make an example out because your misery will be like a story to everyone else so that less will suffer because of you. David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. So the very thing they had to look forward to, the gracious blessing it was to be chosen by God out of everyone, the table of plenty, if you like, they completely failed to recognize and they're tripping over it and the table's fallen on them pretty much. 
It's interesting how he used that verse. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. It's, it, these sound like God's forgotten them. But again, he says in verse 11, I ask again, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? This is the point. Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Stop there for a second. Read that again. I'll let you sit with that for 10 seconds. Is there something in that that's a little bit profound? After that middle comma, not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, because they messed up, because of their sin, what was the result of that? Salvation has come to who? Like, wow, God, not only, this is not absolutely just a failure, He turned it into something that was a massive blessing for everyone else. Salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel what? Envious. Is that what it says in that version? Yeah, envious. So this is the role of the church, not only to share the gospel with the world, but to share with the original chosen people, the ones who have three quarters of the truth but missed the punchline missed Jesus we have Jesus and we actually don't know half the three quarters of stuff that they know so if you've ever met they call them a messianic Jew they'd be a great person to befriend in a university or whatever if you could sit under a person who knows the old testament backwards in Hebrew in fact someone was I was listening to a guy there was a a quote a um, couple hundred years ago that says, Israel, the chances of Hebrew ever being spoken properly and pronunciated properly is about as likely as Israel ever becoming a nation. And that was a fair statement. There is no chance anyone's ever going to speak like they did in Paul's day again because there's no chance Israel's coming back and becoming a nation. Both of those things have changed. And if you know someone who can speak Hebrew fluently, sit with them. As long as they can speak English fluently too. (laughs) Otherwise, you're probably not going to learn much. (laughs) Sorry, can you go back a bit? How do I get the (laughs) bit right in the pronunciation? I haven't met that many Jewish people that believe in Jesus but I've met one guy and he actually said he was from a tribe of Benjamin which they're like the musicians I think and he was a drummer that's why he loved drumming because that's my heritage that's the roots which we're later on this chapter it it talks about that but when I'd say oh yeah what about this parable you know I'm going to preach on that and he's like that ain't got nothing to do with that Like as a Westerner, as an Australian reading that, I've kind of got a little bit of a glimpse of what I think it means. But when he shares from his culture, it's like, whoa, this is way bigger than I thought. And I would love, I guess that's the reason to share this today, is for at least our church to recognize God's heart for Israel and those people and make sure there's not a hint of us versus them. Because if there is, it means we're ignorant and conceited. And when you understand this, it's what we're invited into is something really exciting that's going to unfold in, in days to come. So we are supposed to make Israel envious. So if, but if their transgression, if their sin means riches for the world, so we're richer because they kind of, you know, missed the boat, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, Here's the hope of the future. How much greater riches will their fullness bring? Basically, when they're included in that number we just sung about, we sung, for those at home in the video, when the roll is called up yonder, oh, I want to be there. I want to be in that number. That's another song. Want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Um, There's a day, and can you imagine the party? When Israel, still striving after God, it finally clicks that those weirdo Western Christians that use our book actually had 
the only thing left for us to understand. And the, it'll be like this family reunion. One day the party will include them, like even the prodigal son kind of illustrates. Um, the party is even more profound when the original child comes back, the one that's always been loved. Verse 13, I'm talking to you Gentiles in as much as I'm apostle, an apostle to the Gentiles. This is interesting. So Paul was the Jewish Jew out of all the apostles and God used him to talk to everyone who wasn't a Jew. And Peter was a Jew also, but a fisherman, like he didn't know what Paul knew. And he was called to, to speak to his own people. And the challenges that those two faced in that, oh, I really got to share with those dogs? That's what they said. This is about us. So they had the kind of the racism in the opposite direction. They don't deserve what we have as, as God's, Abraham's children. It's, it's interesting. And God's like, though you would expect, I'm going to choose that guy who's wired for this reason to do that. He's like, no, I'm going to send him there. And I think there's something for in, in that as well. All through the scriptures, God picks the most unlikely person to do something big A. So if you're sitting there going, yeah, I don't know, I got nothing, nothing to offer. God says, who gave you a mouth? Who gave you a tongue? Who gave you legs? Don't say you got nothing to offer because I've given you lots. And if I want to ask you to do something, you better be ready. That's Moses' story, right? He, he's like one of them awesome dudes, heroes of the faith. He said, I can't even talk good. And he couldn't. God said, I'll give you the words because it's about me, not you. So all the way through this, as we sit with a verse, you can. this is what we did Friday night. It's like, oh, does that mean? You don't just read, read, read and go, oh, yeah, I've read this. You stop and you sit about a word or you sit about a phrase. I make much of my ministry, he says, in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. He had a real heart for them. In a couple of chapters earlier, he said, I don't actually get why he said this out loud, but he said, I would rather be cut off from Jesus myself if they got in. That's some serious love, isn't it? I don't know I could say that about anyone even. It's hard. For if, if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Then we go into this interesting part. I'll just spend maybe five minutes on these next bits because it's a really good picture. Some of us like pictures. Some of us are growing up on the farm and they understand about plants and trees and stuff. We have um, orchards. Um, my family, my wife's family used to graft um, citrus and um, what is it, passion fruit. And it's really cool science how you can pick a tough root stock and then put a nice fruit branch into it. And it becomes a tough, nice fruit branch sort of thing, a, a tough tree with a tough roots original so let's, let's work through these last couple of verses um we won't go right through the chapter don't worry last sermon i looked at was 53 minutes and i was like man i went on didn't i but i was getting on a bit of a roll but i hope you're staying with me because some of this stuff's well it's all really interesting and it's what we're here for right if some of the branches have been broken off, so he's talking about those people, the Israelites. There's a tree, it's an olive tree. It was a solid tree. It was going to bear fruit and the branches are just withered and done nothing. There's a few leaves on them, if that. Some of the branches have been broken off and you, now you Gentiles, so this is about you, though a wild olive shoot have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap Shade that three times fast. Share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. Pause there for a second. Picture that. Your adoption into 
God's family is like you are that graft. You are that cut off where you were because that was going nowhere fast. You were going to die if you stayed with that rootstock. Then you were shaved. They make a point with a razor and then they cut a slot in the other trunk and they slide it in so it's a perfect connection and it's bound tight so that sap can continue to flow from the rootstock through. That's you in God's family. Isn't that interesting picture? Where were you before? Lost. Where are you now? It took work for you to get in. So we need to understand this. It's actually really profound. So he says, do not boast over those branches. If one was cut off and you took its place, that doesn't actually mean you were better than them. It just means God did that. If you think about that for a bit, when you think about it in a, when it's talking about our relationship with other people in our community, you are not any better than them apart from what Jesus would do in you, what he has done. So don't boast over those branches. If you do, consider this. You don't support the root. It's like it's not all about you. The world does not revolve around you. In fact, if you disappeared, wouldn't matter to most people. And in this context, you don't support the root as the branch. The root supports you. The point is, without Israel and the Jews and the people chosen by God, we would not be here and we would not have this. Have you ever thought about that? We had nothing without the foundation or the rootstock of the chosen people. And now, yes, it's exciting. We're privileged, no doubt. But it's been because we've been grafted in. And who did it? The branch doesn't graft itself. That's it. I'm out of this tree. <laughs> shave, shave. You, you see what I'm coming? No, you just think I'm weird. You did nothing. You did nothing to be grafted in. Be excited that you've been invited. You don't support the root. The root supports you. You will say then, but branches were broken off so I could be grafted in. He's like, yeah, fair point. But they were broken off because of unbelief. So watch yourself. Because if you get conceited and start to not believe, guess what? A grafted in branch is even easier to rip off. You stand by faith. Do not be arrogant. Be afraid. We never told that as Christians, hey. You imagine these television evangelists. Be afraid, lest ye be cut off. Sounds like a pirate preacher, but anyway. That's how the old time is preached. You do well to listen to the, the, Sir, the Spurgeons and there's a guy called Edwards. He's pretty cool as well. Yeah. Um, anyway, oh, I'm getting off track. We're going to draw it to a close because I think there's some stuff we need to sit with here. They were cut off because of unbelief. You stand by faith. Don't be arrogant. Be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches... He will not spare you either. As we've, as staff, are trying to be a bit more proactive about how was last service, where are we going with what we're teaching and what we're learning, how are we going with discipleship, some of these things, like Paul said, I don't want us to be ignorant of these things because we're going to become stuck up like, the rest of the West that think they know everything and God doesn't really need to be included anymore. The church is in danger of that. Some churches are actually heading down that track. That we're going to change the rules about all this. As we looked at in Romans 1 the other week, we, we cannot change the rules. They're God's rules and what he says will never change. So I'm going to keep saying what he said. Don't shoot the messenger, even though a lot of messengers get shot in the process. I know you guys have have the back of our leadership as we make a stand for things and it becomes more evident. 
So I'd encourage you to go through this and say, Lord, what does this mean to me? Clearly, I'm the grafted in branch. Start off, we say, Lord, thank you for doing that. There's nothing I could have done to graft myself in. Another thing we can do is actually keep our eyes on Israel. Do you know there's some exciting things happening now? So we're blessed to be in the time, the generation where we see Israel become a nation. You think, oh, that sounds a little bit strange. But all through the scriptures, there's this prophecy that I'm going to collect the Jews from all the four corners of the round earth. I don't know why they call it four corners, but anyway. And they're going to want to come back. And I'm going, I look at what's happening in Israel. Yesterday was the anniversary of the Holocaust, like the International Day of Remembering. And there was a huge massacre on yesterday. And the media goes, Israel's to blame even though it was a terrorist thing and the army intervened and whatever. Everything's biased towards Israel. It's so, not just interesting, it's scary that we would be drawn into that same mindset. There's clearly a spiritual battle going on. Everyone hates their guts. But the Bible says whoever loves them will be blessed. And as I was saying, they all want to go home. There is plane loads, immigration has gone of their own people coming back from Russia and every place on the planet. Why are they going back? Because clearly there's going to be trouble there soon as all their neighbours, it also says, will come against them. There's an inbuilt spiritual desire for them to be back. And they're our cousins. We need to be praying for them. We need to be aware of what's going on over there because what happens there is actually indications of how close we are to the end times and there's some big boxes being ticked in our generation so interesting so I encourage you if you want to find out a guy called Amir Safati Safati he says he's a messianic Jew he knows Jesus is the Messiah and he is out there and he's giving updates daily of things that are happening there it's so interesting Um, he believes we're very close to big changes happening and uh, even could be in our lifetime that he returns. So I'm going to finish with that and um, I want to leave you with that. We're going to pray that something out of this will stand out to us personally. Let's close. Lord, we give you thanks for the big picture plan that you started. You knew how it was going to unfold, even though half of it seemed a disaster to us. You are sovereign and your hand is still involved in even the most tragic circumstances. And in the end, every dot, punctuation mark, capital letter of your word will be fulfilled. And no person or plan or kingdom or empire has ever changed that or ever will. Thank you for inviting us in to be your family. Thank you for our brothers and sisters, the Jewish people, that we probably know very little about. What we could learn from them if they would receive Christ would be so much better than I could ever teach. So we pray if there are people around, Jewish people around here, that we may be able to connect with them. Help us to be interested in what's happening over there. Most of all, we pray with a thanksgiving that needs to be developed in us, that we do not deserve to be grafted in. And may we make people around us envious of what we have, not because we have nice cars and houses and stuff, but because we have you. There is something about us that reflects you and they want that. So God, we thank you for your word. We pray that we get even more out of it than we have this morning as we've only just touched on this chapter. And we thank you for the end story that Israel will be included in that number, those of the elect with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Is that interesting? I thought it was. Good.
So our last song is quite fitting. This is the goodness of God. The chorus says, All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. We don't deserve it. We, don't, we didn't earn it. He has chosen us by grace. There's nothing else I can say to make that sound any better. That's what it is. That's who he is and that's what he's done. So let's let's uh, keep worshipping him this morning and reflect on that. Remember that, that he chose us because he chose us. Not because of how good we are. We didn't do anything, but he chose I want to finish with these verses from the end of Romans chapter 11 it says oh the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor who has ever given to God that God should repay them for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let that be your prayer as you go about this week. It's not about you, it's all about him. And he has chosen you to glorify him. So let's live and walk in that.